So the area of Philadelphia in Asia Minor derives its name from an account involving two brothers, Eumenes II and his younger brother Attalus II. The younger brother Attalus had resisted pressure from Rome to turn against his older sibling, and it earned him the nickname Philadelphus, our brotherly love. Such a spirit of brotherly love must also characterize the church. It must characterize us. It must characterize our commitment to our elder brother, Jesus Christ. Neither pressures from this world nor events in this world should ever turn our eyes off and away from our Savior. Fittingly, it was precisely such a spirit of brotherly love that defined the church in Philadelphia. The Lord says to this church in Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, that you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears... Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So it is that the church in Philadelphia suffered on two accounts, because of its location and because of its treatment at the hands of unbelieving Jews. Uh, the city of Philadelphia was located on fertile volcanic soil, often forcing residents had to leave because of a fear of earthquakes. In fact, an earthquake had devastated the region in AD 17. Suffice it to say, the church was not located in the most vibrant of places beyond just the regular occurrences of earthquakes. Unbelieving Jews had begun denying Christ followers access to the synagogue. So the congregation of Philadelphia lived in a dangerous place, consistently under the threat of natural disaster as well as spiritual persecution. Taken in conjunction with the circumstances surrounding this church, we must recognize in whom we rest secure. No matter what, Always keep in mind that we can rest secure because of who Christ is as our elder brother. For one, Jesus, our elder brother, is the Holy One. The prophet Isaiah frequently uses the term Holy One to highlight the deity and person of Yahweh. And so it proves of great consequence when Peter calls Christ the Holy One of God in John chapter 6 and verse 69. You see, it's in Christ's holiness that he gathers the church and makes her holy and without blemish 
in the sight of God the Father. Because of the atoning death of Jesus on the cross for our sins, Christ transfers his righteousness to you and to me. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, for he who knew no sin, that being the Christ, the Holy One of God, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God through him. Ah, the Holy One makes us holy. Two, Jesus, our elder brother, is the faithful one. No one is more faithful to us than is Christ. Proverbs 18 verse 24 refers to him as the friend who sticks closer to us than even a brother. Those who embrace a, a pre-tribulation eschatology will interpret verse 10 as saying the faithful church will forego the great tribulation, but, but I read it a bit differently. God's promise to keep us from the hour of trial, the hour of tribulation, doesn't mean that we will be preserved or removed from the troubles of this world. But it does mean that Jesus will keep us from the faith-destroying effects of them. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says that things will eventually become so bad that if it were possible, even the elect would turn away. But it is not possible. And the reason why it's not possible is because Christ, the faithful one, confirms in John 10 verse 28 that he holds us in the palm of his hand and nothing no one can pluck us from it. Third, Jesus, our elder brother, is the powerful one. Christ holds the key of David, a reference that clearly draws upon the image from Isaiah 22 and verse 22. It's where Isaiah mentions a steward named Eliakim who dwelt in the house of King Hezekiah. And Eliakim had on his shoulder the authority of the key of David that would allow people access into the king's palace or would deny them access into the palace. And that the connection is, is that the powerful one, Jesus Christ alone, can admit people into the kingdom of God. Jesus says in verse 7 that what he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. Christ alone holds the key of salvation. I hope you know that is so. This is not some man-made key. It's not a key based on human wisdom. It's not a key determined by majority rule. It's not a key that any world leader could ever hope to provide. It is a power that is vested in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone as our Savior and as our Lord. Please do not place your hope anywhere else. Do not place your hope on anyone else except for the mighty name of Jesus. No matter what the times may look like that are around us, we must remember where our confidence resides. We are more than conquerors. And Jesus Christ, who loves us. If we have placed our hope in the holiness, in the faithfulness, and the power of Jesus, we can indeed rest secure because our identity is in Christ. Rest secure because you identify with Christ in your witness. The open door that John mentions in verse 8, which no one can shut, is the witness of truth. We know from John 10 verse 9 that Jesus is the door. 
And try as Satan may have done, there was nothing he could do to prevent Jesus from securing an open door to salvation, an open door for his church. The promise of Genesis 3.15 would be fulfilled. Jesus would crush the head of the wicked one at Calvary. And so too, although the synagogue of Satan may try to silence the witness of the church, nothing can prevent the testimony of God's people going forth in holiness, going forth in faithfulness, going forth in power. Nothing can stand against the powerful witness of Christ. <laughs> although the synagogue of Satan might try to prevent it. The open door in the New Testament is often used in the context of evangelism. In Acts 14, 27, Paul and Barnabas returned from their missionary journey. Listen, what they, 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 they returned rejoicing with this report that God opened the door of faith under the Gentiles. In Acts 16, verse 9, while in Troas, Paul has a vision of a man urging him to come to Macedonia. Of that event later, in 2 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13, Paul would say, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. So I went thence into Macedonia. In Colossians 4, verse 3, the apostle asked the church to pray that God may open a door that our message we proclaim, the mystery of Christ, would go forth even when I'm in chains. The Lord uses the faithful preaching, the faithful teaching, and the faithful service of God's people, of his disciples, to open the door of faith for others to enter in. Even persecutors like the Apostle Paul once was, the door is possible to be opened. Even those who were considered a synagogue of Satan in Revelation, it's, it's indicated that some of them would, would come and worship eventually. And, and I think that must be an encouragement to us. And the reason why I think it must be an encouragement to us is because some of us might have relatives who have you know, been very obstinate towards us and obstinate towards the message that we share. Some of us may have neighbors or even friends who have you know, spurned us from time to time. And, and, but God can still open the door. You see, Jesus holds the key. And all we need to do is be faithful to the witness of our elder brother. You never know who God's going to open the door to salvation. So we just be faithful in our witness and trust that the Holy Spirit will move. Rest secure also because you identify with Christ in your weakness. I, I am a fan of the Lord of the Rings. Some of you may have read the books. Some of you may have seen the movies. Some of you may have done both. I commend that to you. And then first, in that trilogy, there is a small, insignificant hobbit named Frodo. And you see, hobbits in Middle Earth were considered to be some of the most weak, insignificant figures. And yet, Frodo was given the task of taking a ring that had been created to draw men towards power and lust. And his mission was to destroy it. I want you to watch this short scene from 
the end of the first film. I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. I wish the ring would have never come to me. So do all who suffer such times. And you know, aren't there times where we feel as if we don't have the strength to endure what lay ahead of us? And yet Jesus will give you a little strength. Just enough strength for the day. Just enough strength for the hour to endure what has been placed in front of you. To endure what it is that you must bear, as hard as it may be. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 4, 12 and 4 through 14, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And it was good of you to share in my troubles. I, I have to say one of the most, I think, taken out of context verses in all of the Bible is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And the reason why I think it's taken out of context is because what Paul is saying is, is that, you know, even in times when it's especially hard, I mean, even in times when suffering is before us, even in times when tribulation lay in our path, who is the one who gives us strength to endure it? Christ. So in the midst of times like these, whatever those times might be, lean into Christ. He will give you of little strength, strength for the day, strength for the hour. And I think that has to be an encouragement to every believer faced with one challenge or another, be it physical, be it mental, be it emotional, be it spiritual. I'd say the physical trauma, difficulty, mental trauma, difficulty, spiritual trauma, difficulty, emotional trauma, difficulty. I think you know that Andy Anderson is dealing with all four of those difficulties right now. In the midst of your trial, in the midst of your disheartenment, you can pray, Lord, give me a little strength for just a little while longer yet. And Christ gives you the strength that you need. Our Lord says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. It is why I say to you, dear child of God, rest secure most of all because you identify with Christ in his word, in his promises. 
you identify with the promise of Christ's presence. Jesus promises to be with his people to carry to carry on, even when their strength is waning, even when they sigh and say, Lord, can I really make it through this? Yes, Jesus says, I shall be with you always, even until the end of the world. It doesn't make the trial go away. It doesn't make it any easier necessarily in that moment. It doesn't remove us from the tribulation, but it does give us the wherewithal to bear it. It does give us the wherewithal to keep moving, to get on the boat and to take the ring where God wants us to go. It gives us the strength to know we can keep moving forward. Because Christ is with you. And McGee, he's with you. Never to leave you, never to forsake you. To walk with you, Karen Wheat. So you further identify with the promise of Christ's place. Jesus says, Elaine Gondor, to his tired and dismayed disciples in John 14, 1 and 2, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So when the Lord says in Revelation 3, verse 12, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, never again will they leave it. We are to understand, we are meant to understand what awaits us. A pillar in the temple was earthquake proof. Ha! Think about that for a moment. He's writing to the church of Philadelphia, a faithful church, a church that was enduring much struggle, much trial, much tribulation, much hurt, much uncertainty. And he says, remain faithful and true. Know that I will give you the strength that you need. But know most of all that I prepare a place for you from which you will never be driven out. Earthquake proof, Philadelphia. So it is that Robert Murray McShane says there are some of you that would glad to be stones in the temple. But Christ says he will make you a pillar. There are some of you that would be glad if you just got in by the skin of your chinny chin chin. But Christ says you shall go out no more. Robert McShane didn't say by the chin of your chin chin. If, if being conscious of your weakness you turn to Jesus. If you cling to Jesus and his word, he promises you not just an anonymous little place in a stone wall. No. He promises you a pillar in the temple of his God. For all eternity, Secure before the Father. Finally, you identify with the promise of Christ's personhood. As believers here on earth, we have begun, just begun, to be conformed to the image of Christ's holiness, to Christ's faithfulness. But in heaven, we shall possess Christ's likeness in fullness. Huh. Think of the glory of that. 
No more sin. Just glory. No more pain. Just gain. As citizens of the New Jerusalem, we will always reflect the name and the beauty and the glory of our almighty God. That's powerful. Just picture that for a moment. I mean, for all that's within me, I, I struggle to understand how a person can look at this world and not see brokenness. For all that's within me, I, I just can't understand that. I can't understand why anybody could say, oh, well, this is as good as it gets. Wow. How tragic. Brothers and sisters, this is not as good as it gets. We will be made like him. We will dwell in the presence of God for all eternity in the glory of Christ. Hallelujah. Joel Beek explains, sometimes here on earth you sigh, Lord Jesus, if only I were more conformed to your image. But when you get to heaven, the Lord will write the name of God upon you. And then you will bear the name of God. You will be like God in holiness, in purity, and in singleness of eye, in singleness of focus. Then you will walk with Christ in the heavenly garden in the cool of the eternal day as we were intended to. For sin shattered and broke what we now see. And you will know intimate friendship with your best friend, your elder brother, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. His name is Jesus Christ. He says we are his. He is ours. Is it not true? Is it not true that sometimes we feel powerless? Is it not true? Sometimes the hurt seems bigger than what we can bear. Is it not true? Sometimes we look around us and we say, God, how are you in the midst of this? Where are you right now? I, I, I can't see you in this. Is that not true? Second Kings chapter 6. King of Aram was enraged against Elisha. So he sent an army to take his life. Verses 15 to 17 of that text. And I, I hope you hear it. Now when the attendant of the man of God, so when Elisha's servant had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. Elisha's servant knew what was going on, knew what was taking place, and so he says, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Look at it! Where's the hope in this? <laughs> so Elisha answered, Do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those 
who are against us. Elisha prayed and said, Oh Lord, open his eyes that he may see. I just want to say, I want to say it a little differently real quick. It looks too big. It looks too hard. It looks too wrong. Lord, open our eyes that we might see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes so that he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You see, he surrounds us. We are surrounded with a host of God Almighty. God's people shall prevail. Psalm 46, 7 says, The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob, he is our fortress. The psalmist sings in Psalm 118, verses 5 and 6, When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Oh, you can add so much to that. What can illness do to me? It may take my body. But it does not take me because Christ holds me in the palm of his hands and nothing or no one can pluck us from it. This world does not win. Christ wins. Christ wins. He's victorious over whatever it is that you face. I know this to be true. And I pray that the word, that Christ's word to the church in Philadelphia would be the word that we hear today and that our eyes would be opened like the servant of Elisha and that we would know, that we would see that Christ wins. I have nothing to fear. That's what I want to remind you of today. I'm not saying that it's easy. Watch the Lord of the Rings. It wasn't easy for Frodo. It may not be easy for you either. you're going to be a pillar in the temple of God for all eternity. And nothing can shake you. Nothing can move you. Nothing can cast you out. There's got to be some hope. I, I pray for us in that. Lord, open our eyes that we might see. Pray with me. Christ, many of us are tired. Give us yet a little strength for the hour for the day, for the morrow, until you come. Oh, Lord Jesus, come. We are yours.
Oh, and that you are ours. Open our eyes to see the magnitude of that truth. We pray in your name. Amen. Our song of response is, I am his. <coughs> he is mine. I, I truly hope that those words prove true in your life. If they don't, if they don't ring true, may the Spirit of God open your eyes today to your need for Jesus. Stand as we sing, the altar is open.